hello everybody. I'm Michelle McKenzie. I'm a principal analyst at Analysis Mason. And for those of you who are not familiar with Analysis Mason, we're a leading management consultancy company focused on the telecoms, media and technology sector. And I work as part of the research team and I'm focused on private 5G and also IoT. And so, um, as Annie mentioned, I've stepped in today and um, I'm going to be sharing some of our research with you, especially related to this question, private LTE and 5G, how hard can it be? Um, Ah, oh, sorry, I'm struggling to, um, oh, there we go. So um, just uh, by way of intro, I'll be going through sort of three, um, looking at three key areas. Um, the first, um, looking at demand for private LTE and 5G networks, which is increasing. Um, and I'll be sharing with you some of the um, information from our tracker. Then I'll, um, sorry, um, I've moving a bit too quickly. Then I'll be looking at today why some of the networks today are, are complex and very bespoke and why this is presenting challenges for um, greater adoption and for scalability um, of this opportunity. Um, and, and then I'll talk a little bit more about what some of the vendors and operators are doing to, to, to sort of um, achieve that sort of widespread adoption and scale. So in terms of the tracker that I mentioned, we've seen demand is growing for uh, private 5G. And I'm showing here some of the European data from our tracker. This is from Q3 2021 last year, but we're currently updating this. Um, and of 120 networks in Europe, right, there, there are obviously more networks, but um, I'm focusing on those where we've got more detail and more data available. Um, so of the, of uh, the, as of um, Q3 2021, there were 120 network announcements um, for, the, for, for Europe. Um, and um, we've um, seen this sort of grow, as you can see here, uh, quite swiftly over the last few years. And, it, and it's continuing to grow very quickly. Um, in terms of who is deploying these networks, so um, of those European networks, the vast majority have been deployed by the manufacturing sector. And I think, um, you know, what, what's important to say here is that uh, there's obviously a large addressable market in terms of manufacturing um, in, in, in Europe. Um, and there, some of the early adopters have been um, companies such as the automotive manufacturers, companies such as BMW, Daimler, um, Ford, um, and they've deployed private networks in one or more of their, their, their factories. But we're also seeing interest from other areas of manufacturing, um, you know, chemical plants, for example, are starting to roll out um, private uh, 5G networks. And then we can see that manufacturing is very closely followed um, by the transport sector. And here we're referring mainly to transport hubs. So airports, for example, ports, um, and, and there's been a great deal of activity in deploying private LTE and 5G um, uh, among, in those sectors. And then as you will have noticed, I've been talking about um, LTE and private 5G. Well. Um, I think we're starting to see a shift now. If we'd looked at the, our tracker a year ago, most of the networks were still LTE. Um, over the last year, some of the, the new announcements have been more focused on 5G. And we're seeing um, a, a lot of interest again in the manufacturing sector for 5G. And I think um, you know that that's that's uh, that makes sense because uh, many of those um, companies that are deploying 5G are interested in some of those attributes that 5G can bring, such as high bandwidth, um, low latency, et cetera. And, um, you know, also, um, I think um, there are manufacturers that want to be at the, the forefront um, of this, who are, want to future-proof uh, their networks, um, and so they're moving straight to 5G. Um, but again, we're, we're also seeing interest in the transport sector as well. And just to comment quickly on mining, oil and gas, you know, maybe not a huge sector in Europe, 
Um, but there's still more interest there for LTE, and that's perhaps because of the coverage needs that uh, are, are more important in that sector. So in terms of um, deployments, uh, we're seeing more awareness, more, more interest, um, and, and the number of networks being deployed is definitely growing. And some of these, um, some of the drivers behind this are, um, well, there are a number of factors. So, you know, starting with this slide, um, sorry, with the first point on this slide, spectrum availability. So um, that more spectrum is becoming available for industrial use. Um, we've seen countries such as uh, Germany um, making um, 5G spectrum available. Um, in the UK, there's, there's uh, shared spectrum availability, and we've seen a number of consultations as well, um, by, by regulators across Europe uh, on this area. So some of those industries that in the past that perhaps didn't adopt cellular, um, thinking here of industries such as utilities, for example, um, and maybe now it, this, is, this is opening up the market a bit because they can uh, apply for their own spectrum license. Another key driver is reducing network spend. So, you know, many of these uh, enterprises that are looking at the private LTE 5G um, networks are um, looking to either replace or consolidate sort of multiple point to point uh, networks that they have in place. Uh, and that's something that we hear a lot um, when we're speaking to, to some of these enterprises. And of course, they're, they're motivated by uh, reducing their costs. Um, greater automation is going to help them to do that. They're looking at reducing outages and increasing productivity. Um, there's also been uh, some um, government interest in this. So government policies, um, funding and stimulus um, funds have become available. And, and some of these are indeed being used um, to uh, fund some of these networks. Um, we've seen uh, this in the UK, but also in Europe with the EU Recovery and Resilience Fund. Um, I think that's, you know, a, a, a number of countries are looking to use some of that fund for digitalization of industries. So um, some interest being created through that. And then there's regulation. So some companies are looking to um, deploy private LTE or private 5G to help them better comply with, um, with the, the health and safety regulations, for example. And here I thought I'd just um, sort of give a case study of, you know, one company that has deployed um, a, a private LTE network and uh, looking to move to 5G in the future. Um, so some of you may be familiar with this company, Hub One. It's the sort of systems integration arm of Group ADP, which owns the Parisian airports. And uh, these, uh, they, they have deployed um, a private LTE network across the three Parisian uh, airports. And um, it makes for an interesting case study. I mean, the, the business drivers that they identified uh, were, were some of those that I mentioned on my previous slide. So they're really looking to deploy a homogenous uh, or a more homogenous network and consolidate some of those different networks that they had in place supporting different applications. Um, there was also the case that some of their networks were becoming obsolete. So, um, you know, Tetra is one of those that uh, some enterprises now are looking to replace. And they were looking for greater automation um, via um, IoT, so deploying more IoT uh, applications. Um, Spectrum was available, so that's helped them to uh, um, move forward with this and, and deploy the network. Uh, so they were awarded 40 megahertz of Spectrum in the 2.6 uh, gigahertz band. Um, and that, that um, will help them with um, in the initial phase, but they'll look to apply for more spectrum at a later date. And then they're working with um, a, 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 an ecosystem of suppliers to bring all of the different components um, to, the, uh, to build the network. And there on the right-hand side, um, looking um, at 
sort of deploying uh, the network to support a number of different applications, um, starting with you know, group communication, so, so some to replace some of the communications networks that they have in place, um, but also looking for some of those airport specific applications, baggage handling, remote maintenance, and so on. So I think um, this, um, these sort of case studies, these sort of proof points uh, are beginning to emerge and um, are, are a good indication of what can be achieved by, um, by deploying these networks. But as I mentioned at the beginning, there are um, still a number of um, barriers um, to, to be overcome. Um, and um, not least of all, these networks are still uh, very uh, tailored to specific um, enterprise needs. They're highly bespoke. Uh, they're, they're typically complex to deploy, and that means that they're costly as well. And we've spoken to a number of different enterprises uh, who, who have considered um, deploying uh, private networks, um, private LTE and 5G networks. And some of the, um, uh, the, the, the reservations they have are sort of encapsulated on this slide. Um, so first of all, uh, one of the challenges is long life cycle. So they may have existing technologies in place that are not coming to, to the end of life, at the end of their life, and therefore they're not ready to replace yet. And you know, if you think about some of the sort of typical uh, lifespan of a factory could be 19, 20 years. So um, it's not to say that all of the technologies need to, to be in place for that long, um, but it is a very sort of slow replacement uh, rate. Um, also companies, um, they're not just looking to rip and replace, they're, they're looking for technologies that will complement their existing technologies. So if they already have Wi-Fi in place, they may be looking for a more integrated Wi-Fi cellular solution. Um, then the question around scalability. So um, as, as one uh, company said here, that the networks don't scale well when you want to deploy them across um, you know, several sites. Uh, and they're not really seeing uh, you know, the cost per network come down, the cost per unit come down as they roll them out. Um, so I think this just goes to highlight that there are still um, a number of challenges out there. Um, I think in terms of the operator model as well, where perhaps a, a more um, a, a hybrid um, deployment model is used using components of the public network as well as uh, private network components. Um, that, you know, that, that's, we're not seeing at the moment because public 5G networks are only just being rolled out, um, that, that we haven't seen a great deal of activity there. Um, and previous um, um, examples of that have been based on LTE, where some of this sort of um, critical functionality to support enterprise needs ha hasn't really been in place. So a great deal of challenges still um, to overcome. Um, in terms of the um, um, what's being done to address some of this, well, I, I think, you know, I wanted to highlight with this slide that um, putting together a, a, a private 5G solution is, is complex in itself. Um, vendors have to assemble uh, different components um, of, uh, to build a complete solution. Um, you know, just showing here, we've got the radio network, uh, core network, they need to bring spectrum into the equation. There will be requirements for integration with um, the cloud. Um, and so very few um, vendors, if any, are, are well placed to deliver a complete solution. And so many of them are having to um, uh, form partnerships in order to do that. Um, and I think AWS's entry into the private 5G market in late 2021 
has certainly motivated other vendors to move more quickly here and that they've accelerated their plans to bring simpler package solutions with pre-configured assets um, to market. Uh, and they've started to do that more quickly. Um, and I think at Mobile World Congress this year, um, it, that really the show really emphasized uh, this year the levels of activity by vendors to partner and bring to market these solutions to make it easier for enterprises to um, deploy and scale. And so we're seeing um, lots of um, different suppliers entering this market, um, very, very much from different backgrounds. Um, but what we're seeing at the moment is that the, the end products that they're trying to put together for private LTE and private 5G are quite similar, um, albeit each of them has a, a different focus area. So if we take the network equipment providers, for example, they're working towards building full solutions um, and, and new capabilities. Um, you know, Nokia has uh, expanded its solution with its um, mission critical industrial edge um, applications and so on. Ericsson has acquired Quartus, a packet core technology vendor to, to, uh, um, to, to add new components to its solution. Um, the challenger vendors are, are very much uh, are very active in the market. They're forging partnerships to ensure that their assets um, form part of a larger vendor's packaged offer uh, and looking at you know, how they can deliver their, their tailored solutions, tailored for enterprise um, uh, to be part of the mix. And we see companies such as Salona, for example, that's been working very closely with HPE and N NTT um, to take its solution to market. Um, then uh, we have, you know, the large enterprise networking vendors, companies such as Cisco and HPE, and they're very much playing to their existing strengths in this market, uh, combining their offer with Wi-Fi to provide a, a package of, um, uh, of networking solutions. Um, so very much sort of playing to their strengths there. Then we have the public cloud providers. Um, I mentioned AWS, um, also uh, Microsoft Azure that's active in this market. And, and their focus is um, very much on the um, compute platform as being, you, you, their compute flat platform as being the foundation um, for many of these services. And, and of course, they have plenty of other strengths in, in providing the in infrastructure and platform capabilities as well to support the applications, for example, on top of the network. And then we've got operators that are looking at uh, delivering the next stage of their private 5G strategies and looking at how they can use a hybrid model combining elements of the public network with private network components uh, to deliver on enterprise needs. Um, and I think it, it's, um, it's interesting because operators can potentially deliver uh, the network components for five, private 5G, um, but also complementary network solutions such as Wi-Fi. And in many ways, their positioning is a strength um, because then they're, they're not committed to how uh, to one vision of how private 5G um, can play out. Um, but it could also be a weakness in that their you know their messaging should not become too diluted. Um, but I think, you know, the important um, uh, takeaway here is that there are lots of different types of vendors um, all building these uh, uh, packaged, complete private 5G solution to start to address some of those challenges of um, complexity, cost and scalability. So just to wrap up really, um, so I, I talked a little bit about demand and, and very positive signs for, for private 5G. Uh, interest in the networks is growing, the awareness is growing. Um, I've spoken about some of the challenges. So the networks are currently bespoke, they're, they're difficult to scale. And we, and we hear that from a, a lot of enterprises uh, that we speak to, um, but there is a lot of activity going on on the supply side to address some of those challenges. 
and overcome some of those challenges. Um, so I think just going back to the original question, um, private 5G networks, how hard can it be? Well, the answer is very hard at the moment. On the demand side, there's growing interest, but as I've said, the requirements can be very specific. Um, and on the supply side, um, private 5G represents a very important opportunity for many different types of suppliers, um, but building those full solutions is, is challenging in itself uh, and it will take time. But only by doing that um, will any of those suppliers be able to expand the market and gain scale. Michelle, thank you. That's um, really interesting. Because, and the point you ended up with about scale, really, that's that's the key, isn't it? And you want to repeat configuration rather yes. than endless customization every time. So it's quite interesting. We have a couple of questions for you, please. And Andreas asks, regarding the adoption of 5G in different sectors, are, those, are the numbers you presented for 5G standalone, a 5G non-standalone, or for both? Um, so very much at the moment, the uh, focus is on delivering um, uh, uh, fully on-premise on dedicated networks. Um, and, you know, we don't have a great deal of there's in many of those public announcements, there's not a great deal of insight or um, detail on the architecture that's being used and exactly how they're being deployed. Um, so, uh, you know, at the moment, what we do see is that there's there's very little in the way of um, the hybrid model that I mentioned and using uh, public network assets uh, to to, um, uh, and then the focus is very much, as I say, on the sort of fully dedicated on-premise model. Okay, and we have another question. Are millimeter wave um, 5G bands more suitable for campus type of private networks? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, I think that's a difficult question to answer at this stage in the market. Um, it may be that they, they are uh, going forward, but at the moment, um, we're seeing so where where the spectrum where we have insights into what spectrum is being used, um, you know, it's it's quite a mix at the moment um, in terms of uh, you know where, for example, Germany three point five gigahertz is available for industrial use. That's being used in other markets. Um, where where companies are working with operators, it will be a, you know the operator spectrum, and that can that can vary quite a bit. So it, it's really I don't think we're seeing very many clear trends there yet. Okay, and talking about the kind of at the moment, this is really a difficult a difficult thing to achieve. What would you think is going to be the biggest sort of um, factor that will will begin to make it easier would that be spectrum allocation do you think i think um i think the spectrum will be a big part for certain industries so um i sort of mentioned in one of those quotes it was from a utilities energy company mm -hmm. and they they uh you know typically for mission critical sort of requirements uh companies would prefer their own spectrum um, but then you see um, in in other, you know, if you look at CBRS in the US market, mm -hmm. and that's created a great deal of interest from all different types of industry. Um, so, so, you know, you've got companies in manufacturing using it, but also in retail, education, public sector, and so on. Um, so I think the spectrum will be um, a very important factor. But I also think that um, ease of... Um, deployment uh, and and the cost factor so companies very much um, you know when we've spoken to enterprises uh, their point of comparison is wi-fi and they're looking for that sort of ease of deployment um, and also those sorts of uh, cost um, price uh, benchmarks as well uh, and we're definitely not there yet with cellular um, with cellular technologies Okay, we have another question. Does private 5G make business sense for a gated community stroke smart city project or should developers stick with telcos? 
Um, well, I mean, I it it really sort of each um, set of requirements is different. I think um, there are there are probably um, I mean, in terms of working with telcos for smart city type applications, um, you know that that does make sense. I, I don't think we we've seen yet a lot of um, smart city deployments uh, for for private LTE and 5G, and I'm not sure that the sort of um, business case there is clear yet. But then you could see for pri for smart cities, I mentioned that hybrid model, so that so there may be um, you know that sort of model may emerge as as more suitable, being able to. Um, have um, you know possibly well in theory at least you know that that model could be a more cost effective model um, for for some for, for some use cases so um, smart cities could be could be one of those. Do you think um, the proliferation of five G standalone? Um, is going to play um, a big part and in the availability of lower latency and network slicing? Well, I think it remains to be seen, but it should, I mean, in theory. Um, so I think, you know, there is definitely a lot of um, activity going on at the moment to, to demonstrate um, that. Um, I think it, typically when we when we uh, speak to enterprises, um, they're, you know, they're, um, their requirements. I think there's interest in having a sort of uh, use it, working with network operators and for slicing models. But there's also a lot of confusion around these different architectures and what they actually mean. And that's definitely come through in some of our conversations with enterprises and some of the surveys we've done. Okay, no, so, so I think it's up to the right. supply side basically to to start working with the uh, with enterprises to sort of educate them on what the different um, options are and what they can offer. Yeah, I was just going to say it sounds like there's some education required. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Okay, Michelle, that was really good. Um, thank you for educating us. And thank you, thank you also <laughs> for. Um, stepping in at short notice it's much appreciated and that was a really valuable contribution to the conference thank you so much thank you very much thanks all bye-bye